Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on uh, calcium signaling. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, how calcium is actually sensed within the cell. Um, because we've already seen how, um, how, if I draw a cell here, how calcium is very, very high in the extracellular fluid. So calcium in the extracellular fluid is about at a concentration of 1.5 millimolar or thereabouts. And calcium in the intracellular compartments are just, I just can't resist putting the brackets around there and putting extracellular and turning that into a proper, a proper approximately equal sign. Okay, uh, but calcium in the intracellular compartment, the concentration of calcium in the intracellular compartment is um, much lower than that. It's 100 nanomolar. And we've talked in the first video about how um, a potential reason that calcium needs to be so low in the cytoplasm is because within the cytoplasm you have a lot of phosphor phosphate groups. And phosphate groups are negatively charged and they basically um, form electrostatic interactions with the calcium, which is positively charged, and precipitate out, forming calcium phosphate precipitates, and that would be detrimental, basically, to the cell, uh, but which needs the phosphate to be solid, you know, in, in solution, so that uh, the energy, um, energy uh, currency, um, currency um, system uh, of ATP being hydrolyzed to ADP in an organic phosphate and then going backwards again. If that's going to be uh, actually functional, you need phosphate um, to be in solution. And if it's all precipitating out, then it's going to make that system uh, unusable, basically. Okay, so calcium is kept very, very low intracellularly, and it's kept higher extracellularly. Now, uh, this can be used, basically, to um, sig to provide signals to the cell, because what you can do is you can open channels in, uh, in the cell membrane, which can allow calcium to move into the cytoplasm from the extracellular uh, compartment. And basically, there's two gradients which are driving calcium to move into the cell when you open calcium channels. One is the concentration gradient, but also you have to bear in mind the electrical gradient across this cell membrane, which is negative 65 millivolts. Now, what that means is that if you have a little man in the extracellular compartment who is measuring electrical potential, uh, so he measures electrical potential in the extracellular compartment, gets some value. If that little man then moves into the intracellular compartment and measures electrical potential again, he'll get a different value. And if he asks how much has it changed from moving from extracellular to intracellular, that's what's meant by the voltage from extracellular to intracellular, or the electrical potential difference between extracellular and intracellular. Basically, he finds that the intracellular compartment is low, has a lower electrical potential than the extracellular compartment, and it's lower by 65 millivolts, generally. Uh, I mean, some cells are more hyperpolarized than that, but um, generally it's around negative 65 millivolts. Okay, now, if the intracellular compartment is a lower electrical potential than the extracellular compartment, well, calcium is a divalent cation. It's got a positive charge. More than that, it's got two positive charges. Uh, so um, it wants to get to areas of lower electrical potential, and it will therefore want to move into the intracellular compartment. So that electrical gradient is also driving the movement of calcium into the cell. So there are two... Um, gradients, a concentration gradient and an electrical gradient which are driving calcium to move into the cytoplasm and will cause calcium concentration to transiently rise in the neighborhood of where these channels have opened basically. So if a channel opens, let's say here, um, I'll draw it in a color so you can see it better. Um, so let's say a channel opens here, uh, then you'll get a transient rise of calcium in the vicinity of that channel basically. And that can be used uh, to cause changes in the cell. Now, to cause changes in the cell, what you need to have is some molecule that is actually going to respond. If you're raising concentrations of calcium there, you need something to actually happen. You need some sort of calcium sensor. Okay, and basically a type of calcium sensor uh, in proteins. Uh, so one of the key effectors of calcium signaling pathways are proteins. So uh, 
how do proteins respond to the calcium, basically? Well, they have certain domains in them which are going to respond to calcium. And uh, one of the types of domain that is commonly seen in proteins is something known as an EF hand. So this basically is just a portion of a protein which has the ability to bind calcium and will change conformation uh, in response to binding calcium, basically. So an EF hand. So it's a domain of a protein. And let me show you uh, the general structure of an EF hand. So the general structure of an EF hand is that it looks something like this. So basically, what's the, what have I drawn here? I've drawn a line, but this line denotes the polypeptide. So it's, it denotes the um, polymer of amino acids. So basically, we have an amino acid followed by another amino acid, followed by another amino acid, followed by another amino acid, etc. So this is the line that denotes this polymer of amino acids, this polypeptide. Okay, now, what you have is this polypeptide forming this loop, like so. And basically, a lot of... This is made up of a lot of amino acids, and a lot of the amino acids in this loop bit up here have acidic res are acidic residues, basically. So they're, um, they're side chains, they're R groups. Let me just remind you of the structure of an amino acid. So this basic structure of the amino acid is that you have this alpha carbon, and then off that you have the amino group up here. And then downwards, you have the carboxyl group down here, okay? Then you have a hydrogen coming off the alpha carbon, and then you have the R group here. And the R group is where the amino acid structure can vary. All of this is set on all of the different amino acids, but the R group can vary. Now, when I say that these amino acids in this loop bit here are going to be acidic residues, what I mean is that this R group is going to have some sort of acidic group there. So examples of R groups that are acidic would be aspartate. So aspartate's R group is uh, basically an ethanoic acid group. So here's ethanoic acid. So that would be the amino acid aspartate. So if you attach this where I've put this R, uh, that would be um, aspartate, or often it can be called also aspartic acid. In fact, what I've drawn here is actually aspartic acid. Aspartic acid refers to the group when it's got this hydrogen attached to the hydroxyl group. Now, um, the this is an acid, and the reason it's an acid is that it can donate that proton off. Uh, basically, uh, this proton can go off, and what you end up with is an oxygen with a negative charge, and the proton uh, with the positive charge, basically. Uh, so it donates its proton, and the group that's left over, where you've got this uh, methylene group and then the carboxyl group with the oxygen with a negative charge and no proton uh, for the hydrogen here, uh, that group left over is then aspartate. So it's what you might call the conjugate base of aspartic acid. Conjugate base. So it's, the, it's what's left after the actual acid has donated its proton, so that's what aspartate is. Uh, but obviously they're very related to one another. Okay, um, so uh, aspartic acid, other examples are glutamic acid, glutama glutamate, uh, which basically is the same as aspartate, but it has an extra methylene group, so to turn aspartate into uh, glutamate, you just add another methylene group in here, so I'll do that in a different colour. So you put in another methylene group like so. And that would give you glutamate, basically, or glutamic acid if the proton was still attached to it. Okay, now, uh, the important thing is that these acidic groups will often donate their protons. So they will lose their protons and they will get a negative charge. And that means you've got lots of groups facing in with a negative charge into the centre of this ring. And that's perfect, basically, for our divalent calcium ion come and sit in here, and it's a little bit out of scale, but um, our, our calcium ion can come in and sit in the centre here and be, um, be electrostatically interacting with all of these negatively charged groups uh, on the sides of these amino acids of this ring here. Okay, uh, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.